It's so good to see you. It's been a while. I know. I know. I don't know when it was the last time it, that we saw each other. How have you been? Yeah, it's been a lot. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm here for the ride. Um, and also trying to be flexible and be like, okay, like things can change, you know? How have you been? I've been good. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Um, <laughs> A big part of Tightwires is the navigation of life after and beyond grad school. I know it's been a while since you've been in grad school, but I'd love to hear more about what you did in grad school and how it may have helped you in your current role. Yeah, so I um, attended the University of Arkansas from 2017 to 2019. I took graduate courses in comparative literature, so um, master's courses. It's um originally more known for getting a PhD in comparative literature but I the reason I decided to go into comparative literature was because I had a mentor who ended up getting her PhD prior to me and she had let me know that this program existed at the University of Arkansas and I was really interested in it just because of the interdisciplinary aspect of the program in the sense that we got to choose our own classes based of course on our like research of study um, or our interests. So that was really nice having that sense of like autonomy and flexibility when it came to being able to select our, our courses. When it comes to connecting it to where I'm at now, I would definitely say that grad school was a very difficult time for me. I mean, aside from that, there was a lot going on personally in my life. I don't know what it's like in other disciplines, but when you're in the humanities and and in particular, you're studying like literature, you're studying um, like the works of other people. It is, it can be very, this is also what I love about reading and what I love about literature at the same time is that you can, um, the text that I was reading was definitely impacting me in the sense of like, kind of putting into question like which I've I've always been this type of person of like asking questions about myself being willing to learn but it was to the point where it was like I was asking all the, I was having all this like internal dialogue about myself my identities my life and luckily I was with friends that were also kind of going through through that process but I think it only further kind of illuminated for me the impact of reading um, on someone's life, that it has really an opportunity to reframe perspectives and offer new possibilities that might not exist in terms of the monotony of life, like being able to think outside of that. And I think that's what's so powerful is like the, I was talking about like reimagining worlds. And I think that's what really, it it had such a big impact on my life, um, grad school. I mean, aside from the fact that attending a predominantly white institution and statistically being a Latina going into going into grad school. I mean, the stats are pretty like stacked, stacked against us in terms of being able to pursue higher education. So of course I was like dealing with that on top of like reading literature from, from a variety of different authors that um, helped me reconsider and um, new possibilities in the world. Can you tell me how Mas Libritos came to be? Yeah, absolutely. So Mas Libritos came about, it had been something that I had been wanting to do for a very long time. And I always tell people that it was a, like, I feel like I was just continually manifesting it over the years, but it wasn't until late last year, actually in September, that I had a conversation with Bites and Bulls about wanting this, like, dream that I had to open up the bookstore. Bites and Bowls, for those who aren't aware, it's a Latina-owned breakfast, brunch, and lunch eatery place located here on East Springdale. They're well known for their sweet and savory waffles. They're so good. Um, so I frequented that place, you know, especially during COVID. And we became, essentially, we became friends. I think I, um, I think some that I allowed at are very, are people that are very personable and are willing to kind of connect with people as you're coming in. But so, so I had a conversation with her of, Hey, I have this idea. I've been wanting to do this for some time. I don't have a brick and mortar. And so she was like, well, don't let that limit you. Maybe we can think about like other possibilities. I originally had also talked to her about a bookmobile idea, which is still, I think on, on the table, something that I'm still wanting to consider, but 
the one I think method that I did see that made more sense in terms of where I was at was the idea of a pop-up. And because this area um, has so many markets too, I knew that it would be kind of easier for me to get plugged in with, with, um, within the ecosystem because it's already something that, that exists. So in September, we had that conversation about setting up. And so from September to December, I was working on getting my, you know, getting, getting oriented with where I was going to order things, getting my website up, getting my social media up, getting, um, you know, setting myself up with a state. So it was a lot of uh, definitely through September, to December, a lot of getting myself ready ready to sell in January. The other thing that I had also done was I did my first initial GoFundMe to be able to to help support that initial inventory of books, as well as like the materials that I would need for the pop-up. And then in January is when I had my my first pop-up. And so it was really special because it was at Bites and Bowls. And then from there, what I did is I had about um, two to three, sometimes it was four times a month um, on the weekends where I would kind of pop up around Northwest Arkansas. My uh, main focus was always more Springdale because of the demographics here in the area and also because of the bookstore and the curation of, of the books. Could you talk a bit more about what Mas Libritos is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I describe Mas Libritos as um, a intersectional feminist independent bookstore that centers uh, BIPOC authors and illustrators. And what I mean by that is that it's a highly curated collection of books. Um, it's ex- it's exclusively and intentionally intended to carry books that have been written, authored, or illustrated by someone that's either Black, Indigenous, or a person of color. And then within that, I I look deeper, you know, and, and think about, okay, what are the other identities that intersect and what are we, who out there is writing about, you know, those, those intersections, whether it's like in fiction, nonfiction, poetry, um, what are the ways in which we can kind of help expand our world and, and give opportunity for people to these authors to talk about, you know, these experiences that they're having. And so, like, for example, one of the poets that I have, her name is Ariana Brown. I had discovered her on social media before the bookstore. And she writes about the intersection of being Afro-Latina and so, but more specifically, being Black and being Mexican. And what does it look like, you know, her experience of what is it like when she goes to Mexico versus, you know, what does race look like there versus race here in the United States and the complexities around that. And so, um yeah, I was I was telling people it's definitely a highly curated collection, and it's also a lot of more contemporary things too. So, um, and I've kind of gone back and forth about that because I was like, I don't know, I feel like I definitely there's some definitely some classics I would say that I that I that I carry, um, but I also want to be able to expose our community to to more contemporary literature. I think, and then it's positioned here. It's located here in Springdale. So the other part of like Mazibitos is that it now has a as it has a physical space. So I went a couple months in um, doing pop ups, and the space became available next to them in in April. So we talked about you know because it's on a plaza. Um, we talked about what would it look like for us to be in the same space, and it happened a lot sooner than what I expected. In a lot of ways, it was very scary and daunting to be like, okay. You you know, I'm going to go ahead and jump into 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 creating a space. But yeah, I would say the other aspect of the identity is, is and I say this because I think it's important to recognize that I'm the first and only Latina-owned bookstore in Arkansas. We do have a Black-owned bookstore in, in Little Rock, Pyramid Books, um, which has a lot of art books. But in terms of, um, you know, owning the bookstores, I think we're amongst, amongst the few that are BIPOC that um, we might be the only ones actually that that own an independent bookstore. Um, the other thing that I would also say that it's a bilingual store. So I um, I myself speak Spanish. Um, some of my signage you'll, you'll see when you come in is in English and Spanish. Some of the texts that I carry are Spanglish. So it's a combination of Spanish and English, as well as like a collection and for adult books in Spanish. And then I've got children's books that are also bilingual. So... That sounds so cool. How do you decide which books to carry in the store? And yeah. once you've decided that, how do you decide which ones to display prominently? 
Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. So the curation of the books, of course, a lot of it has to do with I have to be honest with you with like what I like to read and what I see out there. And so I think a lot of my collection has um, been, you know, grounding myself in, um, you know, literature that I'm familiar with and then kind of seeing like, okay, who else is in proximity with this author? Who else is in conversation with him? You know, and so like, again, with Adriana Brown, I found out about Alan Perez Lopez, who also talks about, you know, same thing in terms of, being um, being Afro Latino and Indigenous, so kind of seeing who else is in proximity with with the other authors. I think you'll find to, and you probably have experiences as well. But like when you're in the publishing industry, you um, the the it's growing. But what I would say, the pro, like um, BIPOC authors, like them getting um, like it's still pretty small. Like I feel like everybody kind of still. Not that they fully know each other within the industry, but I, and I've also, but they know, they know of each other. And I think also something that I've seen within like our communities that are BIPOC is also like them working together. So it's like people going on tour together, you know? So I definitely, my curation has been um, in that way. So maybe not as traditional. I, of course, I, on the more traditional side, I'm still reading like book reviews I subscribe to various um, newsletters within the industry that that helped that helped me with my curation. But I would also say that the creation of the books that I have sometimes it might also be me like scrolling on TikTok and getting on Book Talk and saying like, "Hey, what's out there?" Because I think what's also happening is that our books still require a lot more exposure, and so even the I'm maybe relying more on like non traditional ways of like of finding other other books. And I used to feel a little bit like, I don't know, embarrassed to say that, but I'm like, no, I think actually I I want to be able to find authors that, you know, I feel like I have a range of who I carry of my author. So you might come in and recognize Isabel Allende, but you also might get exposed to someone else that is like contemporary and maybe, maybe like, like upcoming rising, you know, author. Um, so, yeah. How are you navigating the current political and social climate with regard to like book bans and things like that? Yeah. How are you that? Yeah, so I mean, the reality too is that, you know, the reality of it is that most of my books are banned. Um, I think the very premise of the bookstore would cause, you know, some sort of like uproar because there's, for me, there's a decentering that's happening and then there's a, a centering that's focused more on BIPOC. Um, communities and our experiences and in our stories. I think I think that's hard for me to answer because I feel like it's like asking someone almost like, what does it feel like to exist? You know, because it's like this is this is like our stories, our experiences have always been questioned. They've always been, you know, othered. And so in some way or or in some way or the, the other, we've all experienced it. But I think the magnitude of it here in the state of Arkansas I'm not surprised and I haven't I haven't necessarily been asked to join too many conversations when it comes to book banning but I think it's even even if there wasn't an official book banning there's still a banning I think of literature that happens it's it's based on and it can and, and I think it happens in really informal ways it could be you know as you know as um indiscreet as like the type of books that you read whether that be in your high school, you know, middle school, like that reading list has been selected by your teacher, your professor, you know. And so I think even in that, it's like they're already making those decisions with whether or not, you know, book banning had existed. And I think also historically, we know that book banning, this isn't something new. And uh, I think what's really scary about it is that like what... Aside, yes, aside from what book banning um, communicates, you know, that our stories aren't important and they're not valid and they shouldn't be legitimized. I think it's very scary to see how the book, for me, how book banning, and actually not for me, I think history has shown this, also can lead to the rise of fascism, you know, and I think like in terms of very extremist, uh, what I would say very extremist uh, views that are very dangerous, not only just for our communities, but like for everyone, just like coexisting with with each other. And I think that that's what's really scary is the aspect of like 
that book banning not only means it's not just one decision of like, oh, I'm I'm not going to have you read this book. It's like, I'm not going to have you read this book. And you, there's a lack of education that you have around this specific topic. Like for me, the fact that, um, you know, there was even a banning of wanting to teach AP African-American and pla- uh, Black history here in the state of Arkansas. And I'm like, what does that communicate? You know, the communi- for me, it communicates that, that, not only are you unwilling to like to hear our stories, but the reality is that you're you're you're, rep- you're misrepresenting a history that has existed and that continues to exist. And I think that's the other really dangerous part too is that 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 the legacy of um, racism, of patriarchy, and some of these other isms are still present to today. They just manifest in different ways. Do you work at the bookstore full time? Yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> I um, I have a full time job right now working for a nonprofit that also helps us support entrepreneurs and small business owners. There's flexibility in the sense that most of it is is remote or virtual, but I still I still have a full time job outside of the bookstore. It's a lot to balance and juggle, but I think I've always had something like. You know, even in grad school, I had my GA ship and then I was also working. Um, I was also working like part time, you know, so. What's your favorite part of owning the bookstore and what's your least favorite part? Yeah, so I love curating the books. I think that's definitely like at the top of my list. I love like researching different books, Um getting exposed to also other writers that I didn't know about finding different books and also finding ways to um, highlight, highlight those books. Um, And I would also say interacting with people when it comes to the books. Um, I think it's really special. You know, I I talk about how, um, especially now that I have the brick and mortar, I have people that come in that have such an emotional response to seeing the books, you know, and I think, I think it speaks to the need that that exists to see ourselves, you know, reflected, represented, and seen, um, but also just being exposed. Um, So I love, I definitely love that. I actually really enjoy programming. Um, I had, have some programming experience. And so that was something that I wanted to bring in, which I think that kind of falls more into like interacting with the public. Um, I'm actually very introverted. So definitely after like a pop-up or like after maybe spending a full day at the bookstore, like I definitely have to have time to decompress. Or if you ever see me at a pop-up and I'm like with like, if I ha- if I happen to have friends that are volunteering with me, I might be like in the back, just like taking like a moment to myself because it really does um, take a lot out of me to engage. Because I also want to engage like in a genuine intentional way. Um, and sometimes it might also mean like holding people's stories as they come in and talk about. Because I think, I think what happens too is they're like, oh, I wish I had this growing up. And then they talk about their experience, what it was like growing up and how painful that might have been, you know. Um, so holding those stories is definitely hard. And then I think um, the least, my least favorite part would probably be, um, oh, and social media. I actually really love social media. Um, I think it's pushing me. Like I I got a TikTok for the bookstore and I, I don't know, do you have a TikTok? You do? Okay. Okay. I I like I was so nervous, but I also like I love the thrill of it and I love I honestly love that the bookstore's kind of pushing me to do things that maybe I wouldn't normally do. And I think getting a TikTok, um, uh, for those who have TikTok, it might sound like ridiculous that I'm saying this, but I think just getting one and getting it started, I still have more to post, but social media is definitely another one. I think the thing that I like the least though is the administrative um side of things. Like it's all the behind the scenes that like people don't see so it's like when a book comes in like books come in and sometimes like the books depending on the order that I have it could be anywhere from like 50 to 75 books that come in so it's like lugging the books getting them in my car getting them over there then um at the inventory aspect like inputting all the books you know and so um that would probably be my least favorite is the kind of more inventory side and more behind the scenes administrative side of things so which is a big part of of having a business and I understand that but I think it 
I think it's also because like I'm doing everything right now by myself. I think once I'm able to, you know, get help, I think that will be something that I can kind of delegate out. And I'm really glad that you and like someone else had asked me that question too, which I think is a really good like reflection question. So that way when the time comes for me to be able to like delegate out, I can kind of decide, you know, like, okay, this is something that I'm going to kind of like give out, you know, for when the time comes. So So you mentioned programming. Can you talk a bit more about events that you've hosted at the bookstore or like future events that you're looking forward to there? Yeah. Yeah. So this month is um, Latina Hispanic Heritage Month. It's definitely like really busy right now in terms of programming. Um, I um, I can talk a little bit about that. I partnered with Bites and Bowls to bring in um, the author of a book called Have Fun Training, which is like the first bilingual work, like business workbook um, that exists. Um, Ashley will be coming in. We partnered together to bring her in. She's actually going to be coming in next week. And she'll be um, teaching women of color, like how you, how you can scale your business. Um, what I like about Ashley too, is that it's not like a, like, here's how to get rich, you know, like kind of thing, but more so like kind of meeting people where they're at and giving them the tools and like ideas to be able to help them move forward. The other um, author that we're bringing in, um, and she's a consultant business strategist. And actually she's the one that connected me to another author, which is the author that I'm in, that I'm also bringing in. Um, her name is Alyssa. Both of them are from out of the area, from out of the state. Alyssa will be flying in um, the following week, and she is a queer Afro Latina um, children's author that wrote this incredible book called Latinos Are Love. Um, and she'll be coming in to do a little uh, activity, read aloud with the Springdale Public Library. So partnered with them to to bring her in for that. We also host bilingual story time once a month, and that tends to be on the um, I'm going to say the third or fourth Saturday of every month. I just I just forgot. Um, we also have for folks. I don't know. I can't remember when this is going to come out, but we I try to think about programming that's going to bring in like it's not always specifically focused on books it might just be bringing in people you know from the community so we I haven't posted this yet but we've been actually um we are gonna have a the other Marvel's day of the dead like tattoo flash sale um happening and so there's two um tattoo artists that came up with these um like with the designs. And so we're going to bring them in to just do like a, like after hours bites and bowls, like Mazuritos bookstore event. And my uh, bites and bowls, I think is also planning on selling uh, pozole, which is like a, uh, like a Mexican dish soup stew. So, and I also attend pop-ups that aren't always necessarily like book adjacent or book connected. So like I went to a couple of weeks ago, I went to um, a, um, like a house show and I sold books and it was really funny. Like people came up and they're like, Whoa, you got some books. And I was like, yes, you know? And so like, I think, I think, I think bookstores also like independent bookstores are kind of like reframing, you know, the experiences that people have when it comes into, when they, when it comes to like bookstore experiences. And so I'm definitely trying to kind of do that myself too, is like, Not everything has to be directly related to the books. I think sometimes it might just be a matter of like, okay, how do we, how do we, how do we get people into the door? Like, what are ways that we can connect with them? And then while, while they're there, maybe we can talk to them, you know, about the books or the collection. And I think I've also been like, it's, I've been pleasantly, like, I've, I've loved people's reactions when they come in because there's like, whoa, I've, I've like, I have this photography book that I love. Um, that has like the everyday living of, um, I want to say families living, living in LA. It's like very nitty gritty, like, um, and they're like, oh, wow. Like you have this in your bookstore. And I'm like, yeah, you know, so, um, a variety of different programming, I would say, and we have, have kind of more in the, in the horizon, but, um, I, I really do enjoy the programming though. Can you walk us through a typical day in the life of an indie bookstore owner? Uh, Every day looks so different. I think the dynamic of also being inside another business adds another layer to that. So on the weekends, typically, if I don't have a pop-up happening, um, you know, just even from the day that I start, like from the beginning, you know, I like, 
wake up, let my dog out, take her in, get ready, um, try to eat breakfast. But if I don't, then I'll grab breakfast over at Buy Symbols. Once I, I go in, set my stuff down, greet people. Um, sometimes, depending on the day, like I'll check my email. Um, I'll look because I'm subscribed to different um, different kind of um, newsletters. I'll look to see if there's anything that I can add to the cart. Um, I do have a small office in the bookstore, which is really great because I that was something that I needed as well for for storage purposes, and then also having a place to meet, and then um, also just being available to chat with people as they come in. I try not to be intense when it comes to like my customer service. Like I, um, I, I, you know, when people come in, I try to greet them, say hello, ask if they're looking for anything in particular or, or if they're interested, if they need any, any help and kind of just like observe and witness, like watch, I should say, because I, I don't know how you are when you go into a bookstore, but I actually like, I like, that's my time. Like, I don't really, and I think because I like to read too, and I know what to look for or, um, or, and I'm also willing to kind of like look things up on my phone. Like I'm okay with like, just give me time to browse. Like I'm, I'm good. So I try to be cognizant of like, okay, you know, kind of figuring out what it is, kind of their vibes. Um, but yeah, I would say, would say every day is different. It could be anything from like checking my email, adding books to a cart. It could be also when I, when I input my inventory, that's typically after hours because it makes it easier for me. And what that looks like is, you know, books come in, enter them into the system that I use and then shelf them on, on, um, on the bookcases. It could also mean creating the content for social media. So grabbing pictures, grabbing video. I've noticed the a little bit more of an influx of people coming in the past um, the past few weeks. So it might also just mean talking to customers that day and being okay that I'm not gonna like be able to read any email or get or you know um, do anything for social media. It could just simply mean like engaging with people come, coming into the store. So, cause it's a pretty small, small space. I think it's also like, it's much easier for people to come up to me and like talk to me um, about what they're reading or what they're interested in or what they're looking for, or just their experience of being, being in the bookstore too. So. What are you reading right now? So, so <laughs> Something that I didn't know that about this experience of being a bookstore owner is that you don't really have a whole lot of time to read. I feel like you, I spend more time reading book reviews um, than I do and just getting running the business. But I did I I did pick up two books that I'm in, that I'm in between both. Um, I started reading them. I think it was last month. Um, it, what the first book is called rest is resistance um by trisha hershey are you familiar with rest is resistance or the nap ministry yes okay so she wrote this book from the nap ministry trisha and and i didn't know this actually until i started reading her book i think she talks a little bit about it on social media but she started this work when she was a grad student wow yeah i'm, I'm familiar yeah. with the instagram account but i've never read the book yeah, so Breast is Resistance basically takes like the values that she has that she created to build the DAP ministry and puts it in a way to tell you about how she came into understanding rest as a form of anti-capitalism and how how it's so embedded even within her like there's a there's a history, a lineage when it comes to her ancestors and the ways in which, you know, even even folks that were enslaved, um, you know having moments or periods of rest in their life that really pointed to um to like them kind of resisting capitalism i haven't gotten further into this book to say that i know that she gives like basically like i don't want to say tips but basically like examples of like what does that look like what has that looked like you know in her life um, what I like about it too is that she's willing to wrestle the questions that she's gotten when it comes to like how do you rest when you're also trying to survive? Like you need like everybody has to work, and she's like, I understand, like kind of wrestling through through some of that. Um, and I I started reading it. It's one of the books that I carry that I try to at least have one copy within the bookstore because I think I think um, 
she she grounds her perspective, of course, as, as being, you know, she herself as a Black woman, but also pulling in the stories, experiences, like I said, even of her family, of like um, the reality and the stats of like um, Black women dying, you know, at younger, you know, younger, or like the rates of them dying being higher and like the importance of having rest um, in your life. And I'm going on a tangent about the book and you asked me some, something different. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I I love this book. I actually gifted this book to someone else and they're like, I actually really didn't like this book. And I'm like, that's okay. Like, but tell me why you didn't like the book. And they're like, I just don't agree with it. And I think it was within the similar kind of framework of like, we're we all exist in capitalism. How are we going to survive this? And I think that there's ways, I don't know. I, Again, I think this is why reading literature is so important because people like Trisha bring about these possibilities that we think that didn't exist or make us reconsider things. So I started reading that because I was at a point where I'm like, okay, I feel like burnout is coming. What's what's going on? You know, what are ways that I can maybe implement? What does this look like in her life as a daily practice? And how, how can I implement it in my own daily practice? I haven't whatsoever figured out what that looks like. I think it depends on the season of my life. Um, and I think that that will fluctuate. The other one that I started reading, um, which I totally forgot the title of it right now. So let me, um, like the complete title. Um, yes. Okay. So this is the second one that I started to read that I'm like, same thing kind of in between is called The Sense of Brown by Jose Esteban Munoz. And um, he, it's definitely like, a. I found out about this book in one of my, um, it was like, it was a grad school class. It was my first class on theory, actually. And it was on like queer um, sexuality theory, um, using more contemporary works and it rocked my brain. I was like, and this was a piece of text that I wanted to go back to because we had only read an excerpt about, but it's basically about, you know, um, <clears throat> the author, they've passed away. They're, they're, um, they've, I'm not sure when they passed away, but they, um, talk, they were a very prominent, um, scholar when it came to like Brown queer theory. What I love about this, this book, I love introductions and, and forwards. I think, um, so many people like read over them and I'm like, that's like the good stuff, you know, like I, I love it. And I love hearing like pe reading people's like why. And they, this book actually, um, it was a group of his colleagues, if I'm not mistaken, that um, brought like some of his, their essays, um, drawing on, of course, his own experiences and his thought process, but like there, some of them are incomplete and it's because he didn't get, he didn't get to publish it you know, before, before he passed away. And so colleagues that worked with him basically compiled these, um, these essays and put it out there, which I'm like, what a beautiful, like way to kind of pay tribute to this author and to this like scholar, you know, to kind of like, because if not those, I don't know if those essays would have necessarily been like, put out in the world, you know, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm reading that I tend to read more nonfiction, I should have said that I read more nonfiction, and I read, I love a good memoir. Um, I love anything, um, anything that's, well, I won't say anything that's on theory, um, but it depends. Um, anything definitely on feminist theory, I love. Um, and then poetry, I love, I love poetry, so. Do you ever get books before they're like officially released to the world? Like before their official launch and yeah so actually that's like one of the really great benefits i will say of being a bookstore bookstore owner is um ha having access to advanced reader copies that was something that i had no clue about and even like i also want to talk about that too like it was it was definitely a learning curve for me to get into the bookstore like learning all the lingo and jargon like it is a very specific industry and it takes time and I think sometimes it can be very discouraging because then you see other colleagues that might be advancing or like they're aware of all these things and you're just kind of playing catch up. Um, so that is something that I will say is, is very that I found to be very difficult that there wasn't necessarily any sort of like onboarding. Like it really took me going and finding people um, out there. So advanced reader copies, I haven't had a chance to um, get one yet, uh, but you can you can it depends on where, how you order your books but we do have access to um to to books that 
have them put out there in the world, which I think is a, a great marketing tool because then they have us read them and then we can talk about talk about them before before they come out. Is there anything you wish you'd known before you started this journey? Yeah. Um I I that's that's a really good question. Um A lot of things. I I knew that it was gonna. I think I've been very fortunate, and I um you know to get a lot of community support. I don't think I was expecting like the ebbs and flows of like for it to happen. Where like maybe one weekend we have a really we have a really great sales day, and then maybe the next weekend. And I think it, lo- it looks different than the weekend before. And I think that those ebbs and flows, um are really difficult, like as a business owner, um, because it's like right now, you know, I have a full-time job, so that is what financially supports me. Um, But I think if the ebbs and flows and writing them out has definitely been hard. The other thing that I wish I would have known is like preparing myself to say no. I think I'm getting to the point now where I'm going to have to start saying no and, um, And the sense of like, I didn't think partnerships or interest was going to happen as quickly maybe, or, or even the types of people that would ask me to partner with them or to ask me to come to a pop-up. I think that has been something that has surprised me. And I've tried to stay open while also being like, okay, I I can say no. Um, I also didn't know that we would be going through, I mean, it was happening in other states, but I didn't know that we would be happening to be going, would be going through a book banning at the time that I would decide to, you know, open, open the bookstore. Um, I think those, those would be some of the main, main things that I would, um, that I would, I would consider. I've, I've always been someone that I'm like, I'm not about the, like the hustle work culture. That's not something that I, that I believe in. So I've definitely like, I've had some practice to kind of be like, okay, um, like I know I can't do everything all at once and, I, and I'm okay with that, but definitely there's been opportunities that have come about that have happened a lot sooner than what I had expected. So, What advice do you have for anyone looking into starting an indie bookstore or starting any other small business that caters to marginalized communities? Yeah, so I would say that um, definitely think about your why like why you are deciding to open up the business, why you're deciding to open up the bookstore. I think when thinking about the bookstore, people had told me it's a very difficult industry, like because the margins in terms of like profit are very like, you know, thin in terms of we, And so you have to get creative in terms of how, like if you're, if you're deciding to have this be something that you do full time, like uh, right away, um, I think getting creative with how you decide to make profit. I think something that I really wrestled with myself is, well, I think being prepared to that a lot of things are going to come up in the process of opening up the the business. I think it's like you, any sort of like maybe insecurity or any sort of like, I don't know, weakness or area that you would like to improve on. Like, I think I was really hard on myself because I was like, I don't even know how to do this and I'm trying to do this, you know, but understanding that it really is like a learning process and something that I did that really helped me was, like I said, talking to different bookstores. So like Pearls from um, Pearls, like Lee and Daniel have been incredibly supportive and faithful and like they even messaged me the other day on Instagram and they're like, Hey, are, how are you doing? Like, you want to check in? I talked to Paper at Hearts, Little Rock, Beth is incredible. Um, she started off as, as a pop-up similar to me, got her input of like, what does that look like? You know, how do I pay my sales tax? You know, um, she had to like walk me through it. Um, and then, so relying, looking at like different, at different people that are doing similar work too. What I also did was um, looked at models that were similar to mine. And, and actually it was because I visited those bookstores that had those models is what inspired me to decide to have a similar model. So like I was talking about Cafe Con Libros, um, the owner Kalima, um, they're in Brooklyn. She is Afro-Latina. She owns a bookstore. And 
I talked to her and actually she was so gracious and um like last weekend we had a whole like she was like I just want to check because I had a heart I'm gonna be honest I had a heart two weeks two weeks ago it was very difficult I was like the fuck am I doing like is this the right decision so looking at different people within the industry that are doing maybe something so similar as you and like building a coalition with them so I feel like Kalima and there's a couple of other BIPOC owned bookstores that are owners that I reached out to and I was like hey this is what I'm dealing with with Kalima I had a very like honest conversation of like I want to be able to make money to survive but it's not like I'm trying to like be the next you know person or whatever um I just want to be able to survive and so how do I how do you have a, what are like ethical practices this is within the business, you know, um, or how do I stay true to my values, you know, while also trying to kind of build this business and like scale it. So I think, I think also being very clear, not only on your why, but your values. So like, what are your values? What do you want the space to feel like, you know, or the experience to be like when, when people come in, of course, everybody's experience is going to be a little different, but at the core of it, like what, you know, are there similarities in terms of how people are experiencing experiencing the bookstore? So yeah, looking at the why and the values and then also being patient with yourself and understanding that like things change and also being open to possibilities. So like for me, the brick and mortar, it wasn't something that I was planning on doing like in my first year. Like it was like two to three years down the line. I think taking risks is something that's just going to happen, you know, within within the bookstore. And I think you have to decide as your, you know, what does that risk look like for you? What is like, there's different levels to risk. Um, and I would also say, this is like a hodgepodge. I don't really have like a bullet point, you know, um, kind of list. But I would also say it's really important to like ground yourself. I'm learning this. I'm trying to figure out how do I maintain like a social life while you know, having a business. And sometimes I think right now friends have been very understanding and just kind of meeting me where I'm at, which literally means like, okay, Diana has to work at the bookstore today. So maybe I'm going to go like work from, from there, you know, or maybe I'm going to go help her at a pop-up or maybe um, we just go get like a quick drink after the pop-up or just checking in, um, being able to kind of receive that help and support. I was really hesitant at the beginning. I'd be like, no, I'm okay. Like you don't need to help me, but it wears on you. It's it's a lot of work. So I think grounding yourself with people who really love you and really care for you and are willing to extend like grace and understanding. Like even with Galima, she doesn't live here. You know, she lives in New York. I feel very comfortable with being like, hey, I'm really struggling with this. And like feeling like she'll be like, oh yeah, like I totally get you. But also she told me, she's like, I want to warn you that like this is only going to, not that this is going to get worse, but like, those questions are only just going to further kind of like intensify and they're not ever going to fully go away. So I think you have to be okay with like some of those questions still being kind of there. Like it's not going to, you know, you're not going to necessarily be able to like solve it. And maybe this is too soon to say this, but I, I've also, I think coming, you know, coming from someone when, when it comes to giving advice to specifically for like BIPOC, um, bookstore owners or business owners, our starting place is, and they, people know this, our starting place is not the same place as like, I think the, you know, the majority of folks that exist here. I think whether it's like, you know, maybe some of us don't carry some of that generational, you know, wealth or um, what I would say like generational knowledge either. I think that we we can still do the work you know it might not look exactly how we wanted it to at the beginning our communities are very like resilient and can persevere um but I also wouldn't like stay there and be like okay I'm gonna put myself through all of this like I think if you're if if it's not working out for you then don't stay in that space and also what I meant by being too soon for me to say this is like I'm okay with like if two to three year, you know, if it three years from now, the bookstore looks very different than what it looks like now. You know, I've, I've been grappling with the idea of like, okay, the identity of the bookstore is going to change as well. And I think I'm okay with that. And, um, you know, it might, yeah, it might just not exist in the same, the same way. And making sure that your identity isn't tied 
to the business of the bookstore, you know, is really important. Um, you know, having some distance between the two and recognizing like you're a human being, you know, it's not just, cause I think that's another thing that happens with capitalism is because, because we have these like, these rigid ways of understanding the world and our, our place in it. Sometimes it's like, we're just workers and it's like, no, we're so much more than that. We get to experience so much, so much more outside of just like working, you know? So. Thanks so much, Deanna. This was incredibly illuminating. I had no idea all of this went into a bookstore. So I think our viewers will very much appreciate learning all of this. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on and chatting with me. And your questions were really good. I really enjoyed like um, looking over them and answering them as well. So, Absolutely. Where can people keep up with Mas Abritos? Yeah, people can check us out on social media. I've got an Instagram and Facebook. Um, I did mention TikTok, but it's like I have like three videos on it. I'm going to work towards uh, building that out. Um, I kind of want to do like a behind the scenes, like use that platform for a little bit more behind the scenes and less of like a curated space and more of like, okay, like this is the real, real behind it, even though it's still social media. And then I would also say our website uh, for anybody that's listening while we're located here in Northwest Arkansas, we also utilize a platform called Bookshop, which is the alternative to, to um, Amazon in terms of online buying. And so we've got a profile on there. And so the I love Bookshop too, because you get to curate lists, like book lists for people on there. But um, they also have it set up where if you put Mazaritos as the bookstore that you would like to help to support a certain amount of the proceeds, because they handle all the shipping and handling, um, they'll provide us with a certain amount of um, the funds to go back to us. So, and that's another really just great way to, like, again, if you don't if you don't live here but you want to support us, you can order order books through through there. So. Awesome! Yeah. Thank you so much. It was so <laughs> great to talk to you. Yeah, absolutely. Likewise, and it's good to see you. So take care and good luck with everything. Thank you. You too.